In Mamshid. 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 In a very humble but very responsible kind of way. And what do I mean by that? When you see the reconstruction done with materials that are obviously not native, when these iron, when these steel uh, meshes are used, or when you see these wooden beams, or even the metal beams over the over the doorways, that's the the archaeologist's way of saying, "I want you to." Well, specifically here, it's all stone. But what I'm talking about are the columns outside, for example. I want you to focus on This is what we found. I want to give you the sense of the size and magnitude of this building, but I don't want to confuse you and think that this is definite. I want it very, very clear that this is what we think, but we only think that. And by using all of these outside foreign materials, that it's very clear that this metal structure wasn't original, it helps us combine those two needs, it allows us to make that balance. And that's done very nicely in Ovdat, in Mamshit, and compare it to what was done in Masada, for example, where basically based on this, Igael Yadin reconstructed that. Uh, and you don't really know, a lot of times the reconstruction line in, Ovdat, in uh, Masada is not clear. It also has to do with when the reconstruction was done. Reconstruction in, in Mamshit was done in the late 1990s, early 2000s, Masada back in the 60s. Okay? okay. Yes. Yes. They were both reconstructed. In Mamshit, they found a little bit of plaster in one corner that's original and concluded the whole thing. And in Ovdat, they found broken marble in three corners around that baptism bath. And they said, well, we have corners of marble, we're assuming the whole thing was covered in marble. Again, it's an assumption, but it's pretty likely. It's not there. And you'll see another option in Shivta in a month. So all around the Nabataean territory, all around the Nabataean area, we have these kind of structures repeating themselves, <laughs> moving around and looking. They're not anchored to one spot. So we have these kind of structures appearing again and again and again, at least two, sometimes three in the same city. And what I say repeats itself, I mean this kind of structure repeats itself, and it appears in pairs, and it appears in groups of four, and sometimes in an open courtyard like here. And very quickly, Abraham Negev came up with the explanation to what this building is, and called it a stable. Now, if any of you have had any experience with horses, you know that they might be very nice animals, but they're terrible in the desert. They can't carry as much as camel, because they have to drink every day, and they're not very good when their digestive systems are terrible. You need to allow them to eat hay, and they're very delicate, and they might get a colic and die. It's a whole bunch of stuff. They're very pampered animals. You leave them out in the rain, they get wet, and they die. You leave them out in the sun, they get dry, and they die. And not very good. The only thing you could use a horse for, and where they really shine, is if you need a fast animal, if you want to run messengers, or if you want to charge with, your, uh, with the cavalry. You want an army. But if you're trying to trade through the desert, it's the last animal you would pick. Camel, much, much better. The camels were only domesticated very late in human history. Before then, we had mules and donkeys. And we have uh, drawings of donkey caravans going down to Egypt, for example. I'm sure you've talked about those. So for trading through the desert, horses are terrible. And one of the strengths that the Nabataeans had was their ability to domesticate and drive large caravans of camels. That was the big startup of the time. So why do, and camels, for anyone who asks themselves, really do not need stables. You want to keep a camel? Just tie their two legs together. Give them a short leash on their two legs. They can't run too far, they'll stick around. And that's it, that's all you need. So why do we keep finding stables in Byzantine period Nabataean territory cities? So explanation number one is this is a military building. This is for the guards of the city. 
but we don't see them in reference to military structures. We only see them in reference to homes, private homes. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't work as well. It's a possibility, but it's not extremely likely. Abraham Negev said, well, after the trade in myrrh and frankincense declined as a central driving economical force, the descendants of the Nabataeans had to come up with new ways of making a living, and their new export economy was horses. Wow. And during that time, and we do know this, the Arabian horse that out of all horse breeds is the least uh, uh, delicate and the most resistant to desert and, and arid climate, it's still the most pampered kind of animal. But out of all horses, if I have to cross the desert on a horse, I'll do it on an Arabian horse. Arabian horses were bred and created as a... As a uh, as a breed. Breed, breed. During that time, during the late Byzantine period, Abraham Negev claimed that this was actually an export economy. They raised bred horses and sold them outside of this area. Later archaeologists say that doesn't really make that much sense. One, two, three, four, five, six, twelve times three, thirty-six horses in this city, fifty horses in this city. Six cities, 300 horses. That's not an export economy. So, and the counter explanation is it's not an export economy. This is a luxury. Okay. This area was so successful, and some of the people here were wealthy enough Ferrari. to keep horses. To flex with them. Out of you guys, who sends their kids to riding classes? Western riding. Foreign. Okay. Like One of my sons. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The police. The city police. He started as, as, as okay. a therapy, but he continued for 10 years. For 10 years? Nice. It's people from a certain class and above that send their kids to riding classes. I'm not saying anything about yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but if you think of it today, who are the people that buy Teslas? People it, who are trying to care? save on gas? No. 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 You buy a Tesla because you're trying to show everyone else Luxury. that I can afford a Tesla. Why do I keep a horse during the Byzantine period in this kind of climate? It has no other point other than to say, They're Tesla. I can send my kids to riding class. And then that brings us to the question, wait a minute. So did this family in this house, have the, were they extremely wealthy? Possibly. And keep 12 horses. The other possibility is that they were the horse keepers. And this is the Cohen's, and this is the Rabinovich's horse, and this is Baby's horse. And different people in this city keep a horse with the horse trainer. It's a parking lot. That this is a horse, yeah. that this is a, a stable, the structure and the size of it, and the reference that we find, and the fact that we find it in many of these things. They didn't find any bones. What? What? They found bones of horses, but not necessarily. Yosh. Right because you don't bury your horses. Yosh. What about the idea of a hen? When somebody is coming as a visitor, they want to keep their horses. But people who travel through the desert don't use horses. At all. It's not a good animal for the desert. Camel, mule, donkey. Even right. short distances. Horses. Even no short distances. What about a mule or a donkey? Would they? Wait, 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 wait. Too much a mule or a donkey would it be? Keep a donkey outside, they're just as happy. Mules as well. Horses? All right, so we still have both of these explanations, and you'll still find researchers even today talking about both theories. So it's not that one replaced the other, both what you like. And you can use either one. Now, going back to the family that lived here, we don't know what their name was. The name Beit Nabato appears on the sign, but that's just a name given by the National Park. What was found here is this very large stable, but also the house itself is really big. Huge. From here all the way to there where the stairs and we came down is still one house, and even the room we'll go to in a second is still all part of the same house. So I want you to think more in terms of a chateau. This isn't a house or an apartment. But this family, also had something very unusual buried under the stairs. I asked someone here to point at the stairs. Yep. Thank you. And right there, the archaeologists found a single pot, a single vase, with te over 10,000 coins in it. This is what it looked like when they found it. 
and this is what they found inside. 10,000, mostly silver. Silver? Mostly wow. silver. Coins. Drachmot. And Petra Drachmot. Why don't we find things like this? That's a very good question. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it looked like when it was buried. They opened it up to see what they found. And this is the single biggest treasure found from the Byzantine period in all of Israel. And these coins go all the way as far or as late as the 5th century. And what does that mean that the archaeologists found this? It means that whoever it was that left, left in a hurry and didn't have time to pick that up. Because that's not something you leave when you leave. If you abandon the city slowly and you have time, you pick that up. So either grandfather or father died without telling the secret because he died by accident or something like that. Or the people that lived here had to leave very quickly. They didn't even have time to dig up the treasure from below the stairs. So all of these indicate to a very rich, wealthy family between their horses and their coins. And there's one last thing that really tells us that these people were pretty well. And I think it's time to go see that.